Ever thought you would investigate a haunted house? So haunted that the spirits physically fight back and end up fighting for your life? That's exactly what happened to us in this old place in Arizona. We went in thinking it would be just another routine paranormal investigation, but we were dead wrong. Before we knew it, shadows started forming, heard footsteps from nowhere, and one of our own got seriously hurt by something, something we couldn't even see. It was like nothing we had ever faced before, totally defied logic. This is the story of that night, how we barely escaped with our lives and the evidence that still haunts us to this day. So where are we? Oh, there we were, just doing what we do, hunting for the truth, behind the rumors of haunted locations. Our show was gaining traction and people started reaching out, asking us to check out their own paranormal experiences. Most of the time it was nothing serious, just a few prank calls or situations that had a simple explanation. But then, we got this one call that really stuck with us. It was from a woman named Lucy. Right away I could tell, there was something, she wasn't saying something serious. Her voice was steady, but there was this undercurrent of fear that was hard to miss. Lucy believed something not of this world had taken over her house and she was genuinely scared for her grandkids. We'd been doing this long enough to know when someone was genuinely scared and Lucy, she was terrified. So we marked our calendars, packed up our gear and headed out to the outskirts of Arizona on the day of the investigation. The drive was pretty normal, just the crew and me in our van. Sam was behind the wheel, cracking his usual jokes, the kind that would make you cringe, but laugh anyway. Sean and Patrick were in the back, trying to keep up the good vibes. None of us expected anything different from this trip, just another day on the job. But man, were we wrong. We got to Lucy's place in dead night. The house came into view. It was like a dilapidated mansion with a yard that looked like someone had given up on it years ago. The house wasn't falling apart, but you wouldn't call it cozy either. It had this vibe, like something was off. The others didn't seem to feel it, but me? The second I stepped onto the property, I felt this heavy, clammy feeling like something was lodged in my throat. If it wasn't for the investigation, I would have turned around and left. But we were there to do a job, so I pressed on. Even that feeling got stronger with every step. When I rang the doorbell, a frail woman in her mid-sixties answered us. She was dressed in a simple nightgown, looking like she hadn't slept in days. This was Lucy, the homeowner. She led us into the house, a large hall with wooden floors and ancient-looking rafters holding up the ceiling. The whole place felt old and tired, much like Lucy herself. As we settled into the hall, Lucy began to share her story. She had been a nurse at the hospital across the street, but after retiring, she and her grandkids were allowed to stay in this government house. The details of her family's history were heartbreaking. Lucy had two sons, both married, but they were gone now. Her eldest son had died suddenly from a heart attack at just 40, despite being perfectly healthy. Her younger son and his wife had died in a mysterious car crash, leaving no trace of what caused the accident. The room fell silent as she recounted these tragedies, the pain in her voice was raw and it was clear that whatever was happening in that house had taken a toll on her. It was a heavy story, one that left us all feeling a deep sense of unease. Yet, we were there for a reason, and it was becoming clear that this was no ordinary haunting. After sharing the tragic deaths of her sons and their wives Lucy, sat in silence, clearly gathering the courage to continue, there was something more she needed to say something that weighed heavily on her. She finally revealed that she suspected the entity in the house was responsible for the deaths. Her certainty was scary. She described that the strange occurrences in the house, the low hum that was always present if you were quiet enough doors and windows slamming shut without warning, objects moving on their own, and the sound of footsteps upstairs, even though no one dared to go up there anymore. Sometimes it sounded like a party was happening above, yet the rooms were empty. This was more than just a haunting. Something dark and powerful had taken hold of the place. Concerned for Lucy's grandchildren, I asked about them. She explained that they never ventured upstairs after what happened to her eldest grandson, Jim, 
he was a huge fan of our show and had decided one day to take matters into his own hands. Armed with his iPad, the 15-year-old had gone up to the terrace, a place that the family hadn't visited in ages. Lucy recounted how Jim initially found everything to be normal. But then he heard a child giggling, growing louder and more distinct, even calling his name. Panic set in and he ran for the stairs. Before he could reach them, a sudden chill enveloped him and everything went dark. Jim claimed to have seen something forming out of that darkness, a human-like shape, grotesque and terrifying. A foul smell, like something rotten, filled the air and in his panic Jim tried to escape, but felt as though something pushed him down the stairs. He fell, breaking his iPad and injuring himself. He insisted he didn't trip, something had pushed him. The story left us all deeply unsettled. This wasn't just a mischievous spirit, it was something far more sinister, something that had physically attacked a child. I needed to know more about the house itself and Lucy shared what little she knew. They weren't the first family to live there. The previous occupants, the Carlson's family, had experienced similar occurrences, but had kept quiet when they handed over the house. Lucy learned later that the Carlson's had also heard footsteps upstairs, wails, laughter, and even whistling. Someone or something would knock on the door at night, and once a pebble smashed through their window, yet when they looked, there was nothing outside. Lucy recalled a particularly chilling incident the Carlsons had shared. One night, while having dinner in the very hall we were sitting in, they felt like someone else was at the table with them. They heard chewing sounds, loud and clear, but when they stopped eating, the sounds didn't stop. Then a low growl, like that of a bear, filled the room, and a plate suddenly flew off the table, smashing against the wall. The Carlsons! fled the house soon after that, leaving it to Lucy and her grandchildren. As Lucy spoke, the pieces of this dark puzzle started to fall into place. This wasn't just a haunted house. It was a place under siege by something malevolent, something that had been terrorizing its residents for years. There was one more thing. Lucy hesitated to share something that had been bothering her for some time. She hadn't seen it herself, but her younger grandchildren claimed that they had seen a woman in the house. They said she was always watching them, always there but never speaking. This revelation added a new layer of dread to the story. A silent, unseen presence watching their every move. It was the kind of detail that made the hair on the back of our necks stand up. We were dealing with something that had a profound and terrifying hold on this house and its inhabitants, something that wasn't going to let go easily. To get a better understanding of what we were dealing with, I reached out to Patricia, a psychic we often worked with. I sent her some photos we had taken inside the house, hoping she could provide some insight. When she got back to me, her response was heavy with concern. She asked about the location, and after I explained it was a government property in Arizona, practically abandoned, except for Lucy and her family, Patricia's pause told me she had seen something unsettling. She mentioned that when she enlarged the photos, she felt a choking sensation, like the air around her had thickened. Then she saw something that made her voice drop, a woman dressed in red. Patricia described that the woman being strangled, unable to see by whom, but it was clear she was in pain. What really got to me was when Patricia mentioned seeing a large tree in her vision. She believed the woman had been buried under that tree and that it was the key, the epicenter of all the strange occurrences in the house. Her description gave me chills. I hadn't noticed any tree when we first entered, but Patricia was rarely off the mark. I knew I had to check it out. I walked around the house, heading to the back, and there it was, a massive, ancient tree. Its roots were so deep and thick that they seemed to be strangling. The house itself, as if the tree had a grip on the building, refusing to let go. I snapped a picture and sent it to Patricia. She confirmed, yes, that's the one. It was clear that this tree was central to whatever was going on. We were in for a tough night. By 8 p.m. we were deep into the investigation. Sam had set up the full spectrum GoPro, Sean was operating the PSB7 spirit box, and I had my trusty K2 meter. We started in the room where I had discovered the doll earlier. There was something unsettling about it. As soon as I entered the room, the K2 meter's lights began to flicker wildly. 
The electromagnetic field was off the charts, stronger than anything I had ever encountered. The lights danced all the way into the red zone, the highest level. This wasn't just a ghost passing by. This was something powerful, something with a serious presence. I knew it was time to start communicating. I took a deep breath, steadying my voice. I asked if there was someone there who could tell me who they were. For a brief moment, the light stopped flickering as if whoever or whatever was present had paused to think. Then the light started blinking again, even more intensely. It was clear that there was an attempt at communication. We were just getting started. We were all frozen in place, staring up at the ceiling where the footsteps were coming from. But here's the thing, nobody was supposed to be up there. My heart was pounding, every instinct screaming at me to get the hell out of there, but I knew we had to push forward. Why did you go to the terrace? Come back here. All I want to do is chat with you. I yelled into darkness. The footsteps didn't stop. If anything, they seemed to mock us, pacing back and forth like whoever or whatever it was didn't have a care in the world. Me trying again with more urgency. I know you can hear me. Come down and tell me what you want. I'm the first person in a long time who's tried to talk to you directly. Don't you want to use this chance? I yelled again. For a brief moment, the footsteps slowed just enough to make me think I was getting through. But then they picked up again, steady and relentless. I knew we were dealing with something serious, something that wasn't just some lost soul, but a force that could manipulate its surroundings. In the world of the paranormal, when an entity can physically interact with objects, it's a clear sign of unresolved emotional turmoil. And that's exactly what had me worried. This spirit was powerful enough to be dangerous. After what felt like an eternity of this one-sided conversation, I knew I had to do something to provoke a more direct response. Against every instinct of self-preservation, I picked up the doll we'd found earlier. My crew's anxiety was palpable. They were barely breathing, their eyes locked on that doll like it was a live grenade. The moment the doll was in my hands, the K2 meter went wild, its lights flickering madly in the red zone. I checked the doll over, looking for anything that might explain it. Batteries, wiring, magnets, nothing. It was just an old stuffed toy. Firmly but cautiously. Is this doll yours? The K2 meter spiked, the lights blazing into the red. My heart skipped a beat. Me? Do you want the doll? Another spike, just as intense as before. It was clear now, the doll was a trigger, something the spirit was deeply attached to. In paranormal investigations, a trigger object is like a key. It can unlock a stronger connection to the spirit, but it can also be dangerous. If not handled right, it can provoke unpredictable, even violent behavior. But I was in too deep to back out now. I took a deep breath and made a bold move. Okay, here's the deal. I'm gonna take the doll with me. I dare you to stop me. I could feel my crew's eyes on me, their fear almost tangible. But I kept my focus, raising the doll high and then flinging it into the darkest corner of the room. The doll hit the floor with a dull thud and we all braced for the retaliation we knew was coming. For a few tense moments, nothing happened. The silence was so thick it felt like it could be cut with a knife. Then the footsteps started up again, this time faster, as if whoever or whatever it was was fleeing. We followed the sound as it led us out of the room and into the adjoining one. That's when things took a dark turn. Patrick, who was bringing up the rear, suddenly gasped. I turned just in time to see him clutching his throat, his face twisted in pain. He started coughing violently, his body bent over as if he was trying to expel something lodged in his throat. Before I could reach him, he collapsed, choking out a single word, choking, suffocating. It struck me then, this was the same choking sensation Patricia and I had felt earlier, the same one she'd warned me about. A surge of rage flared up inside me, burning hotter than the fear. I yelled up at the ceiling, challenging whatever was causing this. For a moment, everything went still. The footsteps stopped, but the silence was thick with tension. I knew it wasn't over. I decided to keep pressing, trying to communicate on the entity's terms. I asked if it was still there, and almost immediately, the K2 meter went wild, its lights flashing red, 
It felt like the spirit was acknowledging its presence. I cautiously asked if the spirit was male. The meter stayed dark. Then I tried asking if it was female, and the lights lit up bright and clear. We were dealing with a female spirit. I pressed further, asking if she was the one who had choked my crew member. The lights flared up instantly, sweeping to the red as if mocking us. My heart raced, but I knew I had to keep going. I demanded to know why she had done that. Asking why was a question that the meter couldn't answer, but I had to try. Then something happened that none of us were prepared for. From across the room, a sound emerged, tap, 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 coming from inside a large wooden wardrobe. It was unmistakable, like someone was knocking from the inside. The hair on the back of my neck stood up as I stared at the wardrobe. I instructed Sam to open it. He hesitated, clearly unnerved, but he knew he had to follow through. His hand shook as he reached for the handle, and for a moment I thought he might back out. But then he grabbed it and yanked the door open. Inside, the wardrobe was completely empty. No clothes, nothing. But the knocking had been real, and the door had moved with each tap. This wasn't just a haunting. It was a game of hide-and-seek with something that could touch, could hurt, and it wasn't playing fair. We spent the next hour scouring the house, room by room, capturing as much audio and video as we could. After the incident with the wardrobe, the footsteps had died down, but the house was still alive with activity. Every so often, a noise would break the silence. Something unseen would make its presence known, always just out of reach. As midnight approached, Sam, still shaken, mentioned that we should have come during a full moon or a new moon, times when paranormal activity is said to peak. Tonight, there was only a gibbous moon hanging ominously in the sky. I reassured the crew that we needed to get the footage for the show and suggested that Patrick, who seemed particularly affected by the tension, go outside to shoot some footage. I hoped it might calm his nerves. Patrick, his eyes wide with fear, nodded and headed outside. I believed the danger was inside the house, centered around the terrace and the massive tree in the yard. I was wrong, dead wrong. About 15 minutes later, as the house fell back into silence, a scream suddenly pierced the air. The voice was filled with raw, unfiltered terror, making my blood run cold. I bolted out of the room, racing down the stairs, only to realize that the scream wasn't coming from outside, it was coming from another room on the same floor. I changed direction and sprinted toward the sound, bursting into the room, to find Patrick frozen in a bizarre pose. One leg was stretched out at an impossible angle, his face twisted in agony. He struggled to speak, describing a sensation as if something had a hold on his leg, rendering him immobile. My first thought was that his foot might have been caught on something, so I shined my flashlight at the floor. There was nothing, no wire, no trap. His foot was simply suspended, held by an unseen force. Panic surged through me as I grabbed Patrick, trying to pull him free, but whatever had him wasn't letting go. The others joined in, but it was no use. Patrick was locked in place, as though something invisible was pulling him away, fighting against us. In desperation, one of us pulled too hard, and Patrick was yanked off balance, crashing into the adjoining room, which had once been a kitchen. For a split second, we lost sight of him, and my heart nearly stopped. Whatever force we were dealing with was stronger than anything I'd ever encountered. We rushed into the kitchen and found Patrick sitting on the floor, drenched in sweat, his eyes wide with terror. He was gasping for breath, as if his lungs had forgotten how to function. Whatever had been pulling him had finally let go. Patrick grimaced in pain as he pulled up the hem of his pants. On his ankle were five black marks, impressions that looked like fingers. It was as if something had physically grabbed him, something we couldn't see. I reached out to touch the marks, curious to see if they were just surface bruises or something more. The moment my fingers brushed against them, Patrick screamed in agony. I jerked my hand back, my mind racing. Despite everything, I managed to snap a picture of those marks. Even now, I carry that photo with me as a stark reminder of what we faced that night. By 3 a.m., we had gathered enough footage to fill an entire season, let alone a single episode. The house had been active all night, and we had ample material for Lucy and the viewers. Yet, something inside me wasn't ready to quit. The place was alive with paranormal energy, 
and I wanted to push a little further. We decided to take a short break in the room with the least activity, hoping to calm our nerves. I instructed Sam to keep the night vision camera rolling while we sat in silence, trying to purge any hostile vibes that might have crept in. Sean took a seat next to the cupboard with the door slightly ajar. The room seemed harmless enough, but as we sat there, the air grew thick with tension. About 15 minutes in, Sean suddenly froze, signaling us to gather around him. We stood behind him, peering into the corridor outside. Then, we saw it. In the dim light, something began to materialize in the corridor right outside the door where Patrick had been attacked. It started as a dark, smoky form cutting through the moonbeam that filtered in through a small window. We watched, mesmerized, as the smoke began to coalesce, trying to take shape. It was about 15 feet away, but it felt as though it was right on top of us. The night vision camera captured everything. Sam adjusted it for a better view, and I stepped forward, knowing this was the moment of truth. I called out, my voice trembling, announcing that I saw it now and challenging it to come closer. The shape continued to form, growing denser and more solid. That's when the smell hit us. It was so foul and intense that I had to cover my nose. It wasn't just the smell of rot, it was something far worse, something that invaded the senses and made you feel sick to your core. But just as quickly as it came, the smell disappeared and the smoke began to dissipate. Whatever it was had vanished, leaving us standing there, stunned. To this day, I wonder if challenging the spirit was the right thing to do. Maybe it was scared, just like we were, and my bravado had frightened it away. Regardless, it was clear we were done for the night. We packed up our gear, ready to leave this haunted place behind. As I did a final sweep of the house to ensure we hadn't left anything behind, I spotted the doll again. It was back in the middle of the room, lying exactly where I had found it the first time, its lifeless eyes staring up at me. A chill ran down my spine, but I didn't touch it. We had tempted fate enough for one night. By 6 a.m., we had left the house. Lucy was up by then. Though I didn't share every detail of what we'd encountered, I assured her that something was definitely wrong with the house. I told her I'd performed a cleansing ritual and advised her to call us if things got worse. She never did, and I like to think we managed to calm the spirit down, at least for a while. The next day, none of my team showed up at the studio. Concerned, I called each of them, and what they told me sent me into another realm. All three had the same nightmare. In it, they were running through the halls of the house, being choked to death and then thrown off the terrace to the base of that gnarled old tree in the yard. I tried to reason it away, saying it was just their minds processing the trauma of the night, but the fact that they all saw the exact same thing, down to the last detail, was unsettling to say the least. I advised them to take a saltwater bath, a common practice to cleanse away any negative energy, and suggested they take a short break from work. We all needed time to process what had happened. Three days later, we met in the editing room to review the footage. Even though we had lived through it, seeing it on screen was nerve-wracking all over again. As we neared the end of the tape, we noticed something we hadn't seen before. Though our night vision cameras don't have a flash, there were sudden bursts of light on the footage, right before Sean had beckoned us over. We couldn't explain it. There was nothing in the room that could have caused those flashes. Then we saw something else, something we had missed in the chaos of the night. Just before Sean turned his head towards the cupboard, a dark substance seemed to seep out from inside it. Sean's puzzled expression in the footage suddenly made sense. His subconscious had picked up on something his conscious mind hadn't fully registered at the time. That dark substance, whatever it was, had been with us the entire time hiding in the cupboard, waiting for the right moment to make itself known. And when it did, it left no doubt in our minds we had been encroaching on its territory. When I first took on this case, I thought I'd seen it all. I'd been to some of the most haunted places in the country, witnessed things that defied explanation, but nothing could have prepared me for what we faced in that government property. The way the paranormal manifested itself there was unlike anything I'd ever experienced. It was raw, physical, and terrifying. I wish I could share the real footage of everything that happened that day, but I can't. Sadly, 
Every member of my crew passed away one by one under mysterious circumstances. Beyond that, I don't want to share it because all it brought was pain to their families and loved ones. Out of respect for their privacy and their family's feelings, I've chosen not to relive that horror again. Even now, as I sit here telling you this story, there's a part of me that still struggles to believe it actually happened. But it did. And it serves as a reminder that the world we live in is filled with mysteries, some of which we may never fully understand. 